Well, thank you everybody for showing up at the Speaker's Corner this afternoon. I know we all have very busy schedules and it's nice to see you here. My name is Thomas Meyer. I'm Vice President Manufacturing in Bubendorf at Barkham. And I give you a short presentation on the synthetic manufacturing of glucagon. I was expecting a broad audience, so I'll follow my case study presentation, but I open up a little bit to explain to you what Barkham is and what we are doing and what makes us uh, driven and passionate every day. The talk is in two parts. We have a first part where we're going to talk about the improvement of the synthesis, how work we did over the last two years improved the crude material of glucagon, and then I will touch on aggregation behavior of glucagon drug substance which I believe is a very important part of the work we are doing when we work with larger peptides or with proteins. If you look at glucagon, it's a 29 amino acid peptide, so it's a single chain, no disulfide bridges. It's a, what I would call a medium-sized peptide, which is well within what chemical synthesis can do. It is part of a very successful group of uh, therapeutic peptides. It comes together with the GLPs and Exandin-4, which is a, of animal origin. They all are in the range of medium-sized peptides. They're 29 to 39 amino acid in length. They have a high degree of homology. So if you master one of them, you might want to apply some of your knowledge for other ones of those groups. And they have a tendency to aggregate. They're all successful therapeutics. Uh, most commonly known is probably the GLP-1s, where we have a bunch of uh, peptides out there which are very uh, successful drugs. Glucagon itself has two therapeutic indications. One is a rescue kit in cases of hyperglycemia, and the second one is a dia diagnostics in uh, bowl X-ray examination. They are approved drugs, and as often with biologics or peptides, uh, the market is still very much in the hands of the originator, even in times where the patent expired. Bakem is a group of 700 people worldwide, and we are in the business of manufacturing uh, amino acid derivatives and peptides for 41 years. Uh, we are passionate and uh, you find people getting really excited and involved uh, when we talk about manufacturing difficult peptides or even small proteins. And I'm very proud to let you know that this morning uh, around 10 o'clock our CMO, uh, Jody Shastany, was presenting as a, a talk as a finalist of the CPH 2013 award innovation in process development. We don't know if we're going to win. I'm pretty sure we will because uh, what we were discussing was a pioneering breakthrough in chemical synthesis of interferon beta-1. And uh, often when I talk to people, they ask me, where's the border? What, what's the limit of chemical synthesis? And I think that's a very nice example that even molecules uh, glycoproteins going up to 166 amino acid, we, we managed to synthesize that chemically, fully chemical, and we are sure that we have a process which we can build on to have a commercial process. We couldn't do that alone. We did it in collabora collaboration with our friends from Glytech, which delivered the sugar moiety, uh, which we built in in our synthesis strategy. So. We are passionate about getting the best chemical synthesis for peptides and small proteins out there. If you have an interest in that, please talk to us at Barkem. We want to do that. We are really interested in that. Going back to glucagon, uh, it's a lot smaller. It's 29 amino acids. Uh, it's a pretty much straightforward solid phase process, how you find it in the literature. We have four distinguished steps. We have a synthesis first, then we do the cleavage from the resin, contaminantly removing the side chain protecting groups, have then a purification, stabilization, filtration, reconstitution. Today I'm talking what we did uh, to the commercial process we have 
about two years ago to improve the crude material. And I will talk about aggregation propensity, which mainly is happening in the last steps of the drug substance manufacturing. On the right, you see some of the equipment we have in use in Bubendorf. And since we talk a lot about the synthesis, I felt it was worthwhile letting you know that we have 10 75 liter reactors, six 150 liter reactors, and one 1,000 liter reactor in use. They are all uh, solely dedicated to peptide manufacturing. We are a multi-peptide facility, not a multi-purpose facility. The whole thing started, I mean, we had this commercial synthesis uh, developed in the 1990s, and uh, if you have down here the peptide, you start here with the C terminus, you go all your way to the N terminus, and as we follow the FMOC removal reaction, we always had difficulties to remove the FMOC completely towards the end of the synthesis. And uh, for a peptide chemist, that is not uncommon. We, we talk about ag intermolecular aggregation on the peptide resin. So we wanted to overcome that because uh, those not easily accessible sites for the deep protection, they probably also cause uh, difficulties during the synthesis. Uh, if you have a situation like that, I think it's uh, pretty clear what you're going to do. You uh, come up with a plan and we said, all right, we want to look at the building block pattern. A lot of things happened there over the last couple of years. And at the same time, in a second uh, approach, we're going to optimize the activator, the additive, and the solvents. Uh, we use fully automated synthesizers, and importantly, you, you need a lot of LCMS data to really help you understand the chemistry you have or the difficulties you observe. Uh, when it comes to building blocks, there are several concepts out there. We wrote a product monograph on that, which is called pseudoproline and isoacyl dipeptides. Uh, Parkham delivers, and I think that's known to the industry for commercial manufacturing or also to universities for research purposes, building blocks or amino acid derivatives. So if you have an interest in talking about synthesis strategy, please come and visit me at Bachim Boot at 51C2. We are happy to deliver you. We are happy to help you out, possibly also with custom synthesis. That's a very busy slide. I condensed it a bit. Uh, it's again the same. We are starting from the C terminus here. It's the area where we had uh, some challenges to overcome for the FMOC removal. You see in black the initial SPPS and the remaining FMOC values after two treatments with piperidine and DMF. And then going through the first building block pattern, we improved things a lot towards the end, but with glycine 4, we even had a bigger mess. So we, we scratched our head and came up with a new idea, which we call optimized building block pattern. That's green. And here you can see that all FMOC values are very low. There is a complete removal. So we got really, we really resolved that issue of the aggregation on the resin and had a straightforward synthesis. That by itself is nice, but of course you really want to know what that means in terms of purity. And I have two pictures here. Uh, we have the optimized building block pattern. That's 43%. We're coming up from 27% of the crude material with the original synthesis. And if you look at the activators, we optimize that too. So we come to 76%. Those are standardized chromatograms. They go to the same height. So you can really take the, the area you have on the peak and then understand how much of a product you have in there. And easily understandable, it's much easier to purify if you don't have this impurity here. It even gets more impressive if you look at original material, original crude material, and the optimized one. Uh, again, standardized length or peak uh, height, and you see here how much more pure this material is compared to the original material. That's what uh, can be done with state-of-the-art synthesis cap capabilities for peptides. Peptides are in vogue. And uh, I'm sure if we want to make that a sustainable interest of the pharmaceutical company, we have to come up with the best drug substance possible. 
here's a HPLC chromatogram after purification. I'm not going to go into the details of the purification. What we wanted to achieve is almost no impurities at all because uh, they call for uh, qualification. So we see a little bit of a shoulder back here, which we integrated with 0.15%. We have a purity above 99%. And we did extensive peak purity measurement with MS, and there is nothing hidden under the main peak. We put a threshold of 0.2%. So we are very clean here. So if somebody is interested in generics, those uh, molecules there can be done synthetically, and there should be not too much of a headache to go through the regulatory process. If you're interested in larger peptides and uh, small proteins, you also need to consider uh, their aggregation behavior. It's intrinsic to the GLPs and to glucagons. They, they form fibrils, they form aggregates. And uh, to understand that process, how they, they are formed, that's an important part of your development work. I'll show you here what we did with the glucagon project and what kind of capabilities we have in-house at Barkham. But before we go there, I want to talk briefly about something which is very important. When we talk about aggregation behavior or aggregates, of course, what really counts is at the end of the day how many are in the drug product. And the drug product formulation process itself has, is a major driver of this specification of the final drug product. So hopefully this compounding formulation exercise will stabilize your protein or your peptide and give you a drug product with no aggregates or very little aggregates. To do that, you really have to understand all your compounding and formulation parameters. You have to map the design space there and, and understand that. But that's not all, because the drug substance by itself has a aggregation propensity too, and that needs to be controlled. That should be the same all the time, and it's influenced by the manufacturing process. To overcome all different difficulties or challenges which might be around, I strongly recommend that you work hand in hand with the formulation and the drug substance manufacturer. That you don't have any surprises when you get your new drug substance batch and it certainly behaves totally different during your DP formulation. We are by no means the first people working on aggregation with glucagon. There's a wealth of uh, very interesting publications out there. I just highlight two here. This Langmuir one is a very beautiful one which talks about different stress applied to glucagon uh, resulting in different fibrils and aggregates. Very nicely done and very educational. Why do I talk so much about those aggregates or the aggregation propensity? There are several reasons, and I'm highlighting three here. The first one, it clearly can hamper filtrability of the drug substance solution. So when it, somebody wants to formulate a drug product, they often dissolve it. They want to filter it. And if you have aggregates in there, it's not easily filterable. It can impair your analytical testing. Uh, that might be true for your assay or your mi microbiological testing, your endotoxin testing, can be impacted by some kind of uh, turbidity. And generally, it can cause issues during drug product manufacturing that you have surprises because the aggregation propensity has changed. For all those reasons, we consider it to be a critical quality attribute of the drug substance, and we want to control it. The mechanism out there, how aggregation happens to proteins and peptides, um, showing you two which are published by John Philo from Allied Techn Laboratories. Uh, they all start with the native protein, then in this case it undergoes a conformational change, and at the end of the day it end up, ends up with higher oligomers probably irreversible. Irreversible is an important word because whenever you look at aggregation propensity, you should be aware that it might be re reversible and you never know if it's transient and is going back. And if you look at it and you don't know, see it, it could have been there before. So you have to keep bear that in mind when you do your work. The second one I want to talk about is nucleation controlled aggregation. That might be endogenous by 
protein aggregate, which are still present there from previous manufacturing, or also by contaminant like uh, nanoparticles from glass or any kind of uh, polymeric material. Those processes typically have a lag phase, which uh, we're going to look into it in a few minutes, how we use that for testing uh, in a kinetic experiment. Aggregate is a very interesting field and different people use different terminology, so it, it's very crucial that you have a clear classification there. Uh, an obvious classification is by the size. You have uh, different size of those particles and you have a soluble and insoluble aggregates and around one micrometer they consider to be insoluble and then there's the visibility break somewhere around the 100 micrometer. There can be covalent and non-covalent. In our case with glucagon, they're clearly non-covalent. Their reversibility we already discussed and it, it's important if there's a conformational change or not to them. If you look at the analytical technologies, uh, there are probably two clusters. The one cluster gives you shape and size information and the particle count. They typically work on microscope. Uh, you have very nice data there. You can count them. It's reliable in that sense and you can even see low numbers of those countable ones, but you're limited by the, by the size. They need to be visible, so we come down to about one micrometer. Uh, microflow imaging, we're going to discuss in a minute. Uh, light obscuration, like microscopy, those are the, uh, the techniques which are out there. Uh, for the smaller ones, there is an output data which is a quantification of mass in percent. So it might be hard to find just a few what people call seeds. Typical technologies are size exclusion, HPLC, analytical ultracentrifugation. Back in the days, in the 1990s, we, we didn't really have those uh, elaborated techniques in-house at Bach, and we, we used a very simple test. We, we dissolved glucagon, and we looked at the force when you filter it through a filter, and we also measured the content in solution before and after the filter test. So kind of an assay measurement to see if we filtered off any particles. When we looked at it uh, just the other year, uh, we wanted to bring in play the technologies we have at Barchem right now when we decided that we're going to go for microflow imaging and extrinsic fluorescence microscope measurement in a plate reader. MFI is basically a pump uh, and you take pictures and then you can actually count them and your output values are those particles. and. Uh, a diameter which is calculated by the computer. One of the beauties of this uh, technology is that you can actually see how your particle looks like and this is a proteogenic particle compared to a silicon oil or air bubble which might also be present so you can distinguish if it's really coming from your peptide or is it something else. Uh, for glucagon, those are a few values here. We, we took four samples and uh, Unfortunately, it doesn't really work so nicely. Uh, we don't see much till three, day three, and then on day four, we have visible particles, and that was true for all samples. The counts before they get visible is very low. So we decided that it might be that they're translucent particles, and we can't really catch them with the microflow imaging, uh, but we clearly see an increase in viscosity. So that didn't really work so nice. We worked with the Thioflavine T test, and there things looked a little better. Uh, we are using a plate reader, which you can measure your fluorescence intensity in there. It's temperature controlled, uh, a good piece of equipment. First of all, we wanted to start off with a bad, a bad sample. We knew that this one it was prone to aggregation, and clearly it shoots up immediately you got a strong fluorescence signal just at the initial of the test, while with other ones you would like to have a lag period like I showed you with this mechanism of aggregation before. Uh, we put one at high pH because we know from empirical evidence that it dissolves at high pH, but we, we saw immediately an increase 
and we looked at what typically is used for formulation, a pH3 sample, and that looked a lot better. So we were actually happy with what we have seen here and thought that probably we can develop a test method. We then looked at concentration because concentration is a key driver of aggregation. And you see here that at higher concentration, it goes up faster. At slower concentration, it's slower. That was, with, that was in line with our expectation. We then looked at different samples. And here again, we see a difference, which is good. So we could say, all right, this test is really catching up something. And uh, what you like to have is a very flat initial response, which we have in this sample here. If you want to push your process towards this initial flat response, I, I listed a few of the parameters here which influence uh, your downstream, your aggregation behavior, and they are encountered in your downstream process. There are a lot of different influence parameters. All of them are important, and you never really know if it's reversible or irreversible, and most of the time it's kind of grayish, so you have to be very careful and set up your experiments nicely. This brings me pretty much to my conclusion. Uh, we have a synthetic process for glucagon in Bubendorf at Barchem that delivers drug substance for a regulated market. We have excellent state-of-the-art solid phase peptide synthesis equipment and uh, people there, knowledge. And we have a THD aggregation propensity test for glucagon as drug substance and drug product. I didn't show you those data which uh, ensures that we have consistent quality. If you want to manufacture synthetically large peptides and small proteins, it's important that you're focused on details because even the smallest of details is important to get your quality peptide that brings you to the market and to re regulatory appro approval. Bruce Merrifield was the inventor of solid phase chemistry. He published in 1963, and he got his Nobel Prize in 1984. With those remarks, I would like to close. Uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy for any questions you might have. you find us at Booth 51 CO2. Thank you. When you get to this length in uh, peptides, do you typically just use polystyrene-based resins, or do you expand out to PEG? Good question. Uh, 29 mirrors typically is polystyrene. Uh, the pack resins, they're interesting to us, and uh, I know there's a lot of good data out there. We, we are struggling with their inherent uh, characteristic that during cleavage they, 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 <laughs> they swell, and you know, Probably that's what you like during your, your synthesis. So it's, it's probably, it's, uh, it's good that they're swelling during the synthesis, but how are we gonna come over the, the hassle that they expand so dramatically during cleavage? We, we are not quite sure for, for uh, commercial processes. So in those reactors that you showed, do you, do you keep everything in the same reactor for cleavage or do you generally transfer? We typically don't do cleavage in there. We, we have a, yeah, I would like to show you that. <laughs> it's time it doesn't allow. We have a, a cleavage unit over three stories where we have uh, specialized equipment that we can go in with the, the concentrated TFA we are, we are using. And then uh, filtering off is also sometimes a, a little bit of a hassle. So we have an inverting filter centrifuge, a large scale to, to filter that off. It's, it's one line, three, three levels. It's quite beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much.